exercise is important, but I don't think people in the beginning of their journey should be bogged down with the science of how many sets and reps and what style of training. Move your body. Just move your body at first. Focus more on the mental and emotional aspect of your relationship with food and learn about nutrition in general. And just start there. My guest today is Bricks Glover. He's a transformational health and fitness coach who turned his own 150 pound weight loss journey into a mission to help others achieve lasting change. And after making a video documenting his transformation from being 360 pounds to appearing in a fitness competition with a six pack, it went viral and Bricks discovered his mission of being a Sherpa for others to make a similar transformation. He's been on the podcast a couple times before, and in this episode, we talk about the real world weight loss journey and all of the considerations that you have to make in order to melt away the fat and get into the best shape of your life. I saw a video that you put out in a couple of months ago um, about the top 20 misconceptions around weight loss, and I thought that could be a great framework for, for this conversation. Uh, to kind of help give us a through line on on what to talk about, because I'm sure a lot of people out there are interested in getting into better shape, mm -hmm. transforming their body in some way. Yeah, probably most of them want to lose weight, right? right? In the rare cases, this is my my experience because I've I've been an ectomorph my whole life. That's a skinny guy who wants to be bigger mm -hmm. and. Um, and so I have my own journey with all of that. I, I remember getting uh, John Berardi's book, uh, Scrawny to Brawny. <laughs> and after just being fed up with being skinny all the time and, uh, and never being able to put on any muscle. But really what I discovered was I just didn't know how to use the gym properly. Mm. And, uh, you know, you hear a lot of people, I actually heard Oprah talking about how she is just, she was suggesting that there's something wrong with her genetically, that whatever she has tried in the past, she hasn't been able to lose weight and keep weight off. Mm -hmm. And when you start to go deep, and I'm not saying she doesn't know what she's talking about, that's you know her perspective on her experience. Mm -hmm. But in having talked to a lot of people in the field of physical fitness and diet and nutrition, and even just having had my own experiences, I was able, I went from thinking that I wasn't able to put on muscle and keep it on. And following John Berardi's scrawny to brawny program, I had put on like 30 pounds of muscle within six months, which was wow. like, wow, it was crazy. And I had to change the way I was working out. I had to change the way I was eating. I wasn't eating nearly enough food. I wasn't consuming nearly enough calories. I thought I had a very healthy diet, a very, uh, you know, generous portions, but I, I was eating probably one fourth of what I would need to eat to achieve the goal that I wanted. And I don't think people appreciate the, the objective sort of science behind what it takes to achieve whatever outcome you want, whether it's putting on muscle whether it's taking off muscle, but you've competed in a fitness competition, right? You went from 300, over 360 pounds to being on stage with a six pack. And obviously you had to confront a lot of your own personal beliefs and, you know, all the things throughout the process. So I'm sure you probably don't even remember that list right now. Cause that was, that was, you know, maybe a dozen videos ago, but I have the list out in front of me. So I wanted to just kind of go down and uh, and talk about these concepts and, and just kind of unpack each one. So the first one is you can't be passive when you're trying to lose weight. You can't just oops your way into, <laughs> into losing weight or transforming your body. And your, your point was you have to have non-negotiables. And that was my experience as well. So let's talk about some of some of the non-negotiables that that you've in your experience because you coach a lot of people now as well and you have a podcast about this stuff so what are some of the non-negotiables that uh that we need to shortlist when it comes to transformation 
Oh, man. So I think that the response to that would depend on the person. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, But for me, a lot of the non-negotiables, you know, the the first thing that comes to mind for me was was getting control of my snacking was was a huge non-negotiable for me and, and just eating at night. You know that I had a huge problem with eating after eight, nine, ten o'clock. And usually <laughs> during those hours, I wasn't eating kale salads. So that was that was huge for me. Another huge non-negotiable for me was tracking my food intake, right? And really using tracking as a way to develop calorie awareness. I call it calorie awareness. So those are two pretty widespread examples, I think, of a non-negotiable for a lot of us because the accountability around tracking our food and also, you know, identifying what are the key you know, habits that we need to change in order to see any change sustainably. I've tried intermittent fasting and it worked really well for me. And then I went back to just kind of not doing that. But I have my own non-negotiable around this that I still, I actually like, which is I don't eat after like eight Mm o'clock. So I just don't eat anything. I don't care how much I want a snack or have ice cream or whatever. I just have that agreement with myself. And there's a little bit of, you know, if I'm traveling or if I'm going to a dinner party or something, I'll make the occasional exception, but just left up to my own devices. I don't do it. I don't, I don't eat after that. And I don't eat usually before 9 AM. So I found that having just a little bit of restriction, it doesn't qualify as proper, probably intermittent fasting because I used to do I used to do like my eating window was 11 a.m. until 7 p.m. or something like that, which also worked really well. Um, But I just I think to your point, having that even just that restriction, I'm not going to eat after 9 p.m. 9 to because it's just like what Chris Rock said. If you go into the ATM machine at two o'clock in the morning, you're not going there for anything, (laughs) anything positive. (laughs) And it's the same thing going into the kitchen after 10 o'clock at night. You're probably not going to make yourself a kale salad. You're probably Mm -hmm. looking for something else that's not going to add to your goals. Yeah. So there's there's something about the psychology of having non-negotiables that just puts you in a certain frame mentally. And I feel like we need those boundaries in order to kind of keep us from almost finessing ourselves into doing things that aren't in alignment with what we're, what we're trying to achieve. So one can look at it as as a aggressive restriction. Right? There's one perspective on it. And then for me, I like I like the term a non-negotiable or a boundary because it does something psychologically to your decision-making process in these situations when those are clearly outlined, you know? Yeah. And then you talked about tracking your calories and I know for myself, I've, when I first thought about doing it, it seems so complicated, the math and all this stuff and you have calorie calculators online. And, and I broke down one day and I said, you know what? fuck it. I'm going to get a scale and I'm going to just do it. And I ended up doing it for like five days. Cause you know, what happens is most of us kind of eat the same thing day Mm. after day after day. Mm. And what I found helpful was I got to see, Oh, you know, an egg is what four, four grams of protein, Mm. right? Generally speaking, that's not going to change. No. And I got to see that, oh, this this size chicken breast or this size steak that I like to eat, usually it's about 35, 40 grams of protein, okay? Mm-hmm. And I basically had a short list of most of the things that I normally eat, and I could be able to, I could start spot diagnosing how many grams of protein that I was eating in relationship to however many calories that I needed. So my point is, you only have to do the calculation really for a handful of days. And then that gives you a general idea of what you're eating, how many calories you have, how much protein you have, whatever your goal happens to be. And then you don't really have to be so strict after that, unless of course you want to compete or something like that. And you really want to, you know, go all the way with it, but talk a little bit about your thoughts in terms of if there's like two or three things when it comes to 
calorie tracking that mm -hmm. someone listening to this could incorporate that would be sort of a low lift for them just, but they can make a pretty significant difference in the outcome. Yeah. Like you mentioned, having a routine with, with what you eat, right? Like you said, most of the times we're pretty much eating the same, maybe two or three meals for breakfast, two or three options for dinner. So using the apps, because the apps make it really easy to keep track of that stuff. You know, there's your, your history, right? Sometimes it's, it's easy. It, to, it populates automatically because it's so used to you eating the same things. So that's, that's huge. Also, I think it's important for you not to be extremely tedious about it, right? It's okay to estimate. It's okay to kind of, you know, yeah, I, because a lot of the times it's hard to track with specificity when you're eating at restaurants or, or, you know, you're eating at someone else's house and you don't know what the ingredients are. It's okay to approach tracking with the mindset of leniency and, and knowing that it's not going to be exact, but just having a, an idea is way better than just not knowing at all. So just having that balance and flexibility built into your tracking mindset is extremely helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Do you have a scale that you recommend? They're all the same. You know, it's, you order a $10 scale from Amazon, but now actually the tracking technology has evolved to where the point, to the point where now you can take a picture mm. of the meal and it gives you a rough estimate. Is it exact? Probably not. Right. But it gives you a rough, a rough estimate and it removes some of the barriers to tracking your food. Right. Mm -hmm. So it may not be the most accurate, but it's simple as taking a photo of your meal and having somewhat of an idea of what it is. And I think that's important. Right. To just it, it's it's easier to do it that way. So just I, I would suggest people exploring that. There are plenty of apps out there now that are using just a photo and it, it gives you a rough estimate. And I think that's powerful. And when it comes to weight loss, let's say there's like three food groups that universally are just no bueno for most people who want to transform. What would you say that, that if you open up their pantry, those three food groups are probably in there. What would mm -hmm. you say they are? Um, I mean, sugar obviously is, is not a food we should be eating a lot of if we're trying to lose weight. Um, liquid You're cycling calorie. off sugar now, right? Aren't you on like day yeah, 31 days maybe? clean? Okay. Right. That's refined sugar, not like fruit. Refined sugar. Yeah. No, I, I'm not looking at my peanut butter and seeing how much sugar is in right. there, but right, right. just like, it's like Oreos. Or, and yeah. Sugar. Cakes, cookies, mm -hmm. ice creams, artificial sweeteners. I haven't been sweetening my coffee, any, anything like that. Right. Uh, so sugar, liquid calories in general, I think is, is, is a great place to start when it comes to trying to control your calorie intake, because there's so many zero calorie options when it comes to beverages that it, it does, it makes no sense to consume calories in liquid form anymore. So th that's a place I, I would always advise people to, to take a close look at because juices and sodas and, you know, these uh, coffee drinks that have hundreds and hundreds of calories. It's just, Oh my God. Starbucks. It, it, yeah. Like that's sugar, what I, yeah, that's what I mean. Candy sugar, store. Yeah. It's, it's insane. So those are two really easy places to kind of start. And I say easy, objectively, because obviously the sugar part is hard, but those are the main things. Also just focusing on eating whole foods. You know, if, if, if we just ate 75% whole foods and try to minimize the processed foods and, and especially the ultra processed foods, you know, just making those adjustments, you'll see significant changes, not just in your body composition, but in how you feel. You know, I've noticed for myself, I like a little like dark chocolate at the end of the day after dinner or like a date or something like that. And I haven't been to the store in a little bit. So I keep going to my pantry and I'm just looking for something sweet. Right. And I know that if I had cookies in there, I would have eaten those. I would eat the whole thing of cookies. So mm -hmm. I'm a big proponent of just getting rid of those things that you are going to be tempted by because you can't plan for your best day when you have all this discipline and willpower. Mm -hmm. You have to plan 
for your worst day when you got some bad news and you're tired and you didn't have a chance to eat a proper dinner Mm -hmm. and you have some other shit you got to do before you go to bed and you know you're going to be feeling peckish and snacky. Yeah, no, that absolutely. I'm really big on protecting your environment and being intentional about making sure that you're setting yourself up for success. Because like you said, you have to plan for those moments when you are emotionally compromised <laughs> and, and, and you know yourself, right? You, you, you rummage the cabinets looking for, for cookies. It's like, yeah, you have to be, you have to plan for those moments. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions and look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. All right. You said that it will not transfer in your body. So you're sitting there right now looking. I'm looking at you. You have a tank top on. Your muscles bulging out of your tank top. You got the tattoos. You look all sexy and everything. If anybody were to see you, they would assume that you were this really happy, balanced, stable person. And you have said that changing your body will not correlate to fixing all of your problems in life. Mm -mm. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I I tell my clients all the time, if I had a magic wand, right? Let's say right now, let's say like hypothetically, you're over 300 pounds and you're dealing with mental health issues. You don't love living in this body. You have confidence issues. You are dealing with depression, anxiety. If I had a magic wand and I just, Alakazam, gave you the body of your dreams, all of those issues don't melt away, right? But what does help with those things is the confidence you gain during the process, right? So we often correlate, you know, getting this new body as the solution when really it's not the new body, it's what you get to experience from yourself during the process that is the healing um, experience there, you know? So I thought once I, you know, lost weight and that every, my life was just gonna magically be cured of all of these issues and that's not the case. Um, but it was a big, obviously I feel better, I look better. It, it, it did improve a lot of areas of my life, but it was definitely um, the more inward journey that really liberated me from a lot of the issues that I was dealing with on the, on the mental and emotional level. You also mentioned upgrading your relationship with food. So somebody's in the grocery store right now pushing the cart. What does upgrading your relationship with food look like if you are in the grocery store, or if you're on your way to the grocery store? How, what kind of considerations are you suggesting that we, we must make? I think the first place people need to start is to educate themselves on nutrition in general, right? It blows my mind now, but I also remember feeling really ignorant about how nutrition works. So the first step in improving your relationship with food is really understanding what areas of your life is your diet affecting. People have no clue that their diets are affecting their mental health. People have no clue that their diets are affecting, you know, how productive they are at work, right? It's, it's affecting their, their you know, uh, ability to, to climb the corporate ladder. A lot of that is affected by our diets. So that's the first step, right? Really educating yourself, particularly on where in your life, your diet, whatever that may be, is impacting whether that's positive or negative. The, the next thing I like to tell people, we need to teach ourselves to love the foods that love us back. Right now, <laughs> you know, a lot of us, we are, we are obsessed with foods that are destroying us. You know, we overeat these foods that, and again, there's so much ignorance, you know, when it comes to the connection between these foods and, and other areas of our life where we, we, we may be struggling. So the first thing is to kind of pull the curtain back on those sort of things, because that's what's going to give you the incentive 
to actually make any sort of changes. So now understanding what I should be eating because you study some nutrition, right? And then also learning to value feeling good, right? That's a, you have to, we have to teach ourselves that, right? I didn't, I, I didn't care. You know, my baseline when it came to what I felt like was so, you know, it, it was just shitty. Like I, I always felt terrible, so that felt normal for me. But when I started to pay attention to how certain foods made me feel, you know, over time, I started naturally gravitating towards, like I said, the foods that were loving me back because I, I really wanted to feel good all the time, you know? So what, what, is there a sort of Homer Simpson <laughs> uh, way of, I mean, what I mean by that is low effort way of educating ourselves? Is there a resource? Is there a book that you recommend that someone who just doesn't even like to read, someone who's not going to watch a hour long video can start with to just sort of int to introduce this, the, the basics of nutrition so that we can find those foods that love us back? Honestly, the best research is going to be their own body. Mm -hmm. Right. I can suggest books. Obviously, there's tons of books on nutrition. Just understand the basics. What are carbs? What are fats? What are proteins? Understand micronutrients. Right. You could do a basic Google search or use chat GPT to understand that stuff. Understand what role each macronutrient plays in your in which how your body functions. Just having a basic understanding of that. And then from that place, all you start doing is experimenting. When I eat carbs, when I eat red meat, when I eat chicken, when I eat fish, how do I feel? Eat this stuff and then like pay attention, you know? So I think that's because yes, you can read books, but the best education is going to come from the feedback that your body gives you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when it comes to these ideas, the beliefs about weight loss, um, you know, kind of like what I was saying with the Oprah anecdote and all of that, you as a trainer, if, if, if there's uh, there's a hypothetical where you are going to take anybody, take anybody, say 350 pounds, whatever they weigh, doesn't matter. And you had six months with that person and they had to do everything you said. And you were going to make a million dollars once they achieve their goal. Right. And let's say they were going to get some reward as well. In addition to achieving their goal. Do you are you 100 percent confident? that you could get that person to achieve that goal if they follow your instructions? Or is there some exception to the rule? It, if they have a natural, uh, um, you know, a healthy metabolism and they have no like hormonal issues or anything like that, I'm 1000% certain that I can help them reach their goal if they follow the instructions step by step. Because I have a friend with thyroid. She says she has thyroid issues and it's hard for her to yeah, manage, and that's the thing. Manage weight. But yeah. even let's say they had that and you have a million dollars. You think you could. I mean, then, then we're across the line? hormonal treatment, right? They have to get their body right. functioning how it's supposed to first before we start thinking about diets and those mm -hmm. sort of things. Um, so, yeah, no, but that is a, a real issue for, for some people. They have thyroid issues or other sort of hormonal issues that causes. Uh, weight loss to be a little more difficult for them. But the bodies, at the end of the day, the bodies does, most bodies respond to the same inputs. Yeah. That there are nuances in different, you know, in different people, but for the most part, everyone's body, you create a calorie deficit, you're getting enough protein, you're getting enough sleep, you're controlling your stress, your body's going to change. And, and oftentimes when people are struggling to lose weight, they're just eating too much or they're not sleeping enough. Right. Right. So it's, it's really, it's really a numbers game. I mean, it's a little more nuanced than that, but for the most part, if you're eating less calories than you are burning, then you will, your body will change. It's, it's a, it's a law of nature, you know, that, yeah. It, but, but the thing is, those calories are so elusive, right? And if right. you're not tracking the calories accurately, it can be how much salad dressing. It can be a little extra peanut butter that takes you out of that calorie deficit. But the most important thing when it comes to getting your body to change is ensuring that you're actually in a calorie deficit. 
what does that look like? Let's say you, you, your ideal body, you were consuming 3000 calories a day, but could like 2,500 or 2,800 really make that big of a difference? If you're in that, if you're in a deficit of 200 calories or 300 calories on a consistent basis? Yeah. So deficits are created in two ways. You can eat less or you can move more, right? So if there's a deficit of two to 300 calories in the, in the amount of calories you're consuming, and then you're adding on activity that gives it, you know, maybe a four to 500 calorie deficit. Yes. Your body will change. That's just the math of it. So running puts you in a deficit, but it doesn't necessarily build muscle, correct? No. Yeah, it do, it does put you in a deficit, uh, for sure. I'm a big advocate for. I mean, see, running is for heart health, mm-hmm. right? When it comes to creating a metabolic environment in your body, right, and and turning your body into a fat burning machine, you want to rely on weights, resistance training for that. And ideally heavy weights, not like the little five pound BS weights you see. In um, the- if that's where you are, start there, right? I don't want to villainize light lifting because that's what most, some people, they only have access to that, right? For where they are. Eventually you want to aspire to lift heavier weights, but do you need to deadlift 600 pounds? No, <laughs> right? Do you need to be able to throw up 225 for 25 reps? No, but you just have to put some stress on your muscles, whether it's a little bit of stress or a lot of stress. You just have to start where you are and then, yeah, gradually build up. What's your relationship with weighing yourself? Is that beneficial or is it? Is, I mean, the whole thing of what you measure, you can improve. Does that, does that apply to weighing yourself on a regular basis? Yes. What gets measured gets managed. I think you, that, is it for everyone? No. Right. I think it's important to really understand the behavior of the scale and not allow it to be this end all be all. And some some of us and I struggled with this during my journey. It controls us emotionally. Right. It, it, it puts us in these emotional states where, you know, we feel all sorts of disappointment or whatever the case may be. Yeah. I personally, I like to train my clients first in learning how to use it as a tool by first liberating themselves emotionally from what the reading is, right? Because it is a powerful tool because it it guides your decision making, right? If you have something that puts some sort of governor over your thoughts, right? I have clients who, most of my clients, I suggest them getting on the scale every day for one, just to overexpose them to it, right? So that eventually it doesn't have that emotional control over them. And two, for them to experience the fluctuations and for that to be something that is normalized in their head, right? So they're not panicking if one day it's up two or three pounds and the next, so they they understand, you know, the patterns of the scale. Uh, I think it's a powerful tool. I think it's helpful for most people um, but again, you have to have enough self-awareness to determine if it's helpful or not, because if it's, if it's overwhelming you emotionally, then it probably isn't a good tool for you to use. What's the best time of day to weigh yourself? In the morning, after you use the bathroom every you know, at the same time every day. And that's also if you're eating at the same time in the evening, right? Because if you eat your last meal at 7 p.m., on one day and weigh yourself at 7 a.m. And then you eat your last meal at midnight and you weigh yourself at 7 a.m. You can get two very different readings. So the more consistency you have with your meal time and your weight time, that's going to give you the more consistent uh, readings. Okay. So you just mentioned uh, emotions. And one of the misconceptions you listed was if you avoid your emotions, you will eat your emotions. What do you mean by that? So after high school, as I mentioned, you know, I was dealing with a a lot of um, tough emotions as I was stepping into my adulthood. Right. And I didn't know how to process them. I didn't know. I didn't understand what was what was going on. Well, all I knew is I was experiencing uncomfortable emotions and 
I learned that food helped me escape them momentarily, right? I didn't have the equipment to deal with the emotions. So I just tried to avoid them. So, and mindfulness has been a powerful, powerful tool for me that helped me get my emotional eating under control, right? Uh, just learning to sit with my emotions and, and understand what's going on. And then slowly over time, I don't want to make it seem like it was just this decision. Slowly over time, I was able to stop using food for an emotional pacifier. And I started using other tools, you know, breathing, um, just stillness, journaling. These are, these are like my gold tool tools for processing my emotions, which of course helped me um, not abuse food. Yeah, and obviously meditation is a really big um, uh, tool that you can use, one can use for processing emotions because the kind of emotions I think we're referring to is stressful, distressful emotions, which can have can wreak havoc on your digestive system, your ability to sleep, your immune system, your hormonal balancing system. So all the things that may be stopping someone from being able to drop the weight, even though they're doing the work, uh, it could get slowed down by stress and it can speed up through, if you are doing the right things, it can speed up through uh, consistency. Mm -hmm. And so you, you talked about consistency over perfection. And there's something you, you said, I think you posted it on social media. You said you don't count how many miles you run or something like that. You say you count starts. It continues. So you have yeah. To stop. Yeah, exactly. You count continues. How many times you continue? And mm -hmm. as long as you're continuing one more time than you're stopping, mm -hmm. you're moving in the right direction. Yeah. And, and it's consistency over intensity. It's kind of like my motto. And what you're referring to was this aha moment I had during a run one day where I made it, I almost gamified. And that's something I, I like to do with the activity happening in my mind. It's like, try to find a way to gamify this scenario that I'm in, in order to arrive at the outcome that I desire. So I was in, a, in the middle of a run and I said, hey, I keep hearing my, my, the voice in my head telling me to stop, right? And then I'll check in with my body. Am I tired? Yes, right? But I know I still had a little bit more in the tank. So I started to count how many times I can hear that voice trying to convince me to stop running and I'm gonna continue running anyway. And I would just like count how many continues, you know, I, I, you know, I managed during that run and it became a game changer. That's how I started to really get distance in my runs. It's, su it's such a mind game. It's such a mind game. I tell this story about, you know, I, I used to have this three mile route that I ran and every, every time I ran this three mile route, route at the same mile marker, I would start to experience the discomfort, the thoughts of stopping right at 2.3 miles in. But one day out of nowhere, I decided to run five miles and I didn't start getting the pains, the voice in my head telling me to stop until I'm at like f mile four this time. And it showed me how mental it all is, you know, so I, I think having those experiences it kind of changes. Um, it, sh it changes what it feels like when you feel that urge to quit, and uh, it helped me develop some grit and some mental toughness that I then applied to other areas of my life. I saw you do something once that I actually did as well, and it works beautifully. Which is, you get on your, you get on Instagram, go to your stories, and ask people to hold you accountable, guys. Oh, yeah. I really want to quit right now. I said I was going to do three laps or five laps, but I'm ready to stop. I need you guys to hold me accountable. And mm -hmm. you keep reporting back in. And that that has worked powerfully for me as well, because there's no voice more convincing than the voice in your head when you hit that wall and you, you know, you start coming up with all of these BS reasons why it's a good idea to stop and cut it short. And mm -hmm. you, know, you start negotiating with yourself. And I just have to remind myself that, look, that voice is going to come. In fact, if it doesn't come, that means you really weren't, mm -hmm. you really weren't you know, in the zone yeah, that you yeah. need to be in to, yeah. to create growth and, and progress. So you can expect it to happen and you need to be ready for that, 
for, for you to try to talk yourself out of it because that's exactly what's going to happen. And if you make, if you go public with it, that's, that's a great hack for overcoming your own blocks. Another powerful, I guess, hack I use is, is gratitude. So mm-hmm. I was on a, I was on a run recently and I felt my body start to break down and I had this goal, you know, I wanted to reach, yeah, I think I was running like seven miles and at mile five, my body started breaking down. I made up this imaginary character in my head, right? His name was John. He was an ultra marathon runner and he got into a car accident and he lost his legs, right? So I'm running, I'm envisioning John in his bed with his legs amputated. And I'm saying, John, I'm going to finish this run for you, bro. And I ha- like I visualized John like cheering me on. And all of a sudden, the pains, you know, everything, that, all the discomfort that I was feeling magically just kind of dissipated, right? The power of gratitude and, and visualization, it, it, you know, it's, it may sound, you know, for, for, for those, and I know your audience understands this stuff, but when I break this down to certain people, they're like, bro, it sounds crazy, but no, it's, it's a physical relief of the symptoms that I feel from this visualization, again, speaking to the power of the mind. Yeah, I've done that too. I I would sometimes, let's say I have another what mile or something to do. I'll come up with a service oriented goal and say this is dedicated to children of Gaza. This is dedicated to mm-hmm. everyone who can't walk. You know, mm-hmm. and then that that little um, hack, which where I make it bigger than me, mm-hmm. can give me that extra little lift to get get beyond the block as well. Yeah. I love that. I love that. All right. So, um, you talk about being intentional about your circle and to hang out with fit people. And I know a lot of fit people don't want to hang out with unfit people. (laughs) So, So how do you, how do you situate yourself so that you're hanging out with more fit people than unfit people? Um, Because it's kind of like saying, you know, oh, you should network with higher net worth people. It's like higher net worth people don't want to network with broke people who aren't really able to add to that conversation in a beneficial way. So I just find that's an interesting, I I agree with you and I find it's an interesting topic. And maybe you're talking about even curating your social media following. So then you have virtual Mm -hmm. um, fit people that you're quotes hanging out with. I think there's a lot you can bring to the table you know, in both scenarios, whether, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you know, trying to associate yourself with higher net worth individuals, or if you're currently on a weight loss journey, trying to associate yourself with fit people, I think there's enthusiasm, there's, you know, um, this spirit of wanting to learn that both groups of successful people appreciate, right? Um, and, And just making friends at the gym, in general, right? I think the gym community for the most part is a very welcoming, you know, we, it's almost like there's there's this tribe, right? We, we are the minorities when it comes to just like the world in general, there's this tribe of, of people who are all trying to be better physically, you know, and mentally, but mostly just physically. Um, and we, we want people to join us there, you know? So, yeah, there's, there's ways to bring value to to that group of people that will, you know, allow them to invite you into their into their circle. So, yeah, it's just bringing some spirit. Well, you don't want to be the person who's like talking too much and keeping people from their workouts and all that stuff. You want to kind of be locked in and focused when you are. Here's what I would do. I would say, hey, bro, can I sh- just shadow you? Like, I won't get in the way. You don't have to work out with me. I just want to kind of just see what you're doing, maybe jump in in between your sets and see if I can try, like starting with that, right? Trying. And if you say like, I, I've i always admired your physique. I've seen you in here working out. Like any and guy no who you say that to. Say no to that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like there's no one that's going to say no. So <laughs> trying that, you know? Yeah, you're my role model. Play, play on our <laughs> egos a little bit. <laughs> All right. Uh, progress is a roller coaster. Take it one day at a time. Even in your documentary, you talked about how you would like regain 20 pounds and then lose 15 pounds. And 
And again, this kind of ties into consistency over perfection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think what a lot of us need to do is redefine what progress even means. For, for a lot of us, progress is only scale victories, right? Is, am I losing weight on the scale? But there's so many ways to, you know, um, to, to track progress. And it's, there's so many ways that we just ignore. And I think the more opportunities we have to feel successful, the more momentum, right? The more motivation you'll feel. But if you're focusing only on the scale, you're, you're missing tons of opportunities to feel successful. And it's important to feel successful on this journey, right? Are you sleeping better? Is your mood better? Are you stronger? Are you feeling, is your skin clearer? Are your eyes clear? Are you like, there's so many ways to feel successful and so many wins to celebrate. Um, so th there's that, right? First and foremost, let's let's kind of reframe what progress really means. And then also expect it not to be linear, right? It's, it's, it's not this incremental, predictable process. Sometimes you'll have to lean into non-scale victories to kind of keep you going, right? You, sometimes, yes, the scale is going to move or you may see changes in your body and sometimes you won't. But I think ultimately... And for a lot of people, I want to acknowledge, you don't start off thinking much about every, ex every workout is an investment into my health, right? But I think it's important to really plant that seed and understand that the reason why you're exercising, the reason why you're making healthier eating choices matters a lot. Because if you're only doing it to see the number on the scale drop, you're putting yourself in position to feel disappointed and then when you don't experience what you find as progress or the reason why you're doing it, you're going to lose all motivation to do it. So if you can start to look at exercise, each workout as an expression of self-love, right? An expression of self-respect, right? An investment into your vitality, right? If you can look at each workout, each healthy eating choice as an investment, it changes the experience a bit, you know? Yeah, I interviewed Ed Milet, and uh, his story is involves him going to a doctor and the doctor saying that you're not going to live long enough to walk your daughter down the aisle at the rate that you're going right now with your health. And mm -hmm. so he, he reclaimed his health with that bigger sort of purpose in mind. Like, I want to be there for my family. And it's not even just about me. It's about all of the people that, uh, that depend on me. So I totally agree with that, that, you know, at, at the end of the day, and you see this all the time on social media, anyone who does any sort of transformation ultimately becomes a thought leader in that space. They do the before and afters. They get a lot of people reaching out to them. Hey, what did you do? Can you show me? Right. Even if they don't want to be a thought leader, or they're not intentionally being one. It's just an inspiring journey. And so, and you, in our First episode, you talked about how you were still, you know, what you called fat bricks and you were giving people, you know, workout advice because <laughs> you knew that that's the direction that you were going in and people would laugh at you mm -hmm. because you were still on the surface, you were still out of shape. But what had happened was you got your mind right. And that was the first, that's what you alluded to earlier. The first step is getting yourself in the right mindset to be able to move forward. And, uh, and I think a part of that is the, actually the next point, which is you have to be prepared to make sacrifices. I heard Chris Williamson say something so profound. He said when he was going through his little health journey and he got the six pack, he said, look, my six pack is the story of all of the waffles and all of the pancakes that I didn't I eat. Because mm -hmm. you can have anything you want, but you can't have everything at the same time. Mm. So talk a little mm. bit about the sacrifice. Yes. Sacri so that's a huge part of it. I mean, probably should feel obvious that if you have certain goals, there's certain things you're just going to have to give up, right? Um, but I I'd even like to answer this from the perspective of, of how important it is to adopt an identity, right? A certain identity 
and make choices from this new identity, right? Because if you're operating, right, from your old operating system, right, your relationships, your thought, your thought and your attitude, your attitude about exercise, your attitude about healthy eating, if it feels like a sacrifice, because that's the thing. Is it a sacrifice? Yes, right? By definition, it's a sacrifice. But what if you chose to look at it as an investment instead of a sacrifice, right? You're not giving anything up by not putting crap into your body. You're not sacrificing anything, right? But a, what a momentary pleasure, uh, you know, of a, a dopamine hit from sugar or whatever the case may be. Like, no, you can still experience pleasure from food but foods that nourish you, you know? So I like to even reframe that idea around sacrifice because it's something that it doesn't make us feel good when you think about, when you frame it that way, oh, I'm going to have to sacrifice certain things. Yes, is that true? But let's choose different language because our language matters. You you know that, right? Yeah, I love that. I love I love the idea of looking at it as an investment. And even going further than that, looking at it as a process of you betting on yourself because mm. because once you start to really be mindful around your diet everyone around you is going to become a dietitian everyone around you is going to become a nutritionist yeah. and tell you you're eating too much protein you should be doing this you should be mm. doing that meanwhile they're all you know wolfing down McDonald's and mainlining those Starbucks sugary drinks but they everyone and their mother has an opinion about whatever it is that you're doing or not doing and uh, and you have to be able to effectively navigate that. And I was going to say tune mm -hmm. it out, but you know there may be some value to some of the things that they are saying. You just never know. And you talk about that too. You talk about educating yourself constantly, um, which reminds me of uh, a, a time when I made this commitment to run up this hill, to do hill runs. I was going to do 10 laps a day for every day for um, for like six months or something like that. And I started doing it and I did it for like three months without fail. It was one of the hardest things I ever did. Never looked forward to it one time. Always was grateful mm -hmm. I did it after the fact without exception. Mm -hmm. And then I talked to a friend of mine who was a trainer and I told him what I was doing. I was all proud. I, he said, why are you doing it? What's your ultimate goal? I said, to get ripped. He goes, oh, well, you, you're doing it wrong. You, you, mm -hmm. you should be sprinting up the hill, not not casually jogging up the hill if that's your ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, and initially I was like, oh man, I wasted all this time. But when I really thought about it, I I felt good about the effort that I made because I proved to myself that I could maintain the consistency around it. And it made me appreciate the new information even more. Mm. Um, so I continued on. Now I was sprinting up the hill instead of jogging up the hill. And and now after having this conversation, I realized I was still working on my heart health when mm -hmm. I was jogging up the hill. Absolutely, yeah. So Absolutely. there are no wasted throwaway moments Whoa. if you are showing up for yourself. Absolutely. Let's talk about, um, you said sleep is a super weapon when it comes to transforming your body. Obviously, we've all heard, you know, we need to be sleeping better and whatnot. What are some ways that you've used in the real world that have improved your sleep? The, 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 the number one thing that I've done is to stop eating two hours before I go to bed. Mm -hmm. Has made the biggest difference in, in my sleep quality. I also started tracking my sleep. So I'm a big data-driven type of person. It data drives my behaviors. So no getting a report of a report on my sleep every single morning, it changes how I prioritize my evening routine, how I plan my day. Like I plan my day to optimize my sleep, you know, so that level of intention, you know, for us folks who are super busy and have a ton of things going on, it's important to have accountability uh, around you know, making sure that we do what we need to do to optimize ourselves for sleep, because it's one of the things that has given me the highest ROI on just my overall health in general, you know, is uh, prioritizing my sleep. But yeah, making sure I don't eat at least two hours before going to bed has been a, a big one. Um, and I don't know, man, I'm still I'm still 
debating if this whole screen time, like what, you know, the blue light from the screens, I don't know. Cause I, I track my sleep pretty closely and I've done experiments where I, where I cut out the screens. So I haven't seen much difference personally. Um, but the number one thing for me is, is definitely not eating two hours before, before bed and just getting to sleep at a, at a, at a decent hour. Yeah, something I've actually adjusted relatively recently is I stopped drinking water at around mm -hmm. seven o'clock because mm -hmm. I find that if I drink water, because I'm a big proponent of water and you know green tea and stuff like that, if I drink eight thirty nine o'clock, I'm probably going to have to get up in the middle of the night and mm -hmm. go pee, mm -hmm. which obviously disturbs the sleep. Because of course I try to talk myself out of it. it's like oh I'm, you know I can wait oh you know I'll just another 30 minutes or whatever. But then eventually it's like, this is, it just gets too uncomfortable and you just have to mm -hmm. get up. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I stop the water intake earlier in the evening and maybe I'm unique in this way, I don't know, but it, I can then sleep through the night without having to get up and go pee. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's been helpful for me as well. That's something I implemented recently. What about showering before bed? Do you, is that something you do? We, you and I talk mm -hmm. privately about taking cold showers and mm -hmm. And uh, what's been your experience? With all of yeah, that? I shower before bed for sure. I don't know if that contributes to my sleep quality. I mean, I've, I've read in places like warm showers kind of calms you. I know I wouldn't do cold showers at night, though. Right. Yeah, definitely not. Have you done that? Uh, they're, hard. they're harder at night. I made it done once or twice, but I actually heard, I read somewhere, speaking of continuing to educate yourself, that actually, if you want to sleep better, it's better to take a hot shower than it is to yeah. take a cold shower. Yeah, for sure. Uh, which makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean when you say failure is a part of the process of transformation? Yeah. So I think uh, we have this villainized idea about failure when it's actually, I mean, as cliche as it sounds, it's, you have, you learn so much from failure. And if you have that more optimistic viewpoint about failure and you look at failure as an opportunity to learn, you, you gather so much information that helps you significantly on a, on a weight loss journey. But when you allow failure to be this catastrophic event where you're then you know, uh, you know, stepping into shame because you've attached this, this quote unquote failure or this misstep to your identity. I'm a failure. I did, I messed up and you allow the, 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 the voice in your head to run amok. You know, I just think it's one of those powerful perspective shifts. Hey, failure is going to be a part of this process. I'm not going to be perfect. You know, failure is going to be an opportunity for me to learn my patterns, learn my triggers, learn, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And if you kind of take on that perspective, I think it's extremely helpful. And that's, it, it, you have to practice doing that, right? You have to practice choosing to look at failure as opportunity because our default is to feel all of these negative emotions. And this is why with all of my clients, I'm a big proponent of mindfulness and journaling and, just building that level of self-awareness, emotional awareness, so that you can train yourself to look at these moments as opportunity. I'm associating what you're talking about mainly, not all the time, but mainly with the uncontrollables, which is how your body is responding based on whatever's going on or not going on inside of your body and how the weight can sometimes fluctuate. And you talk about the importance of owning your shit and taking full responsibility and I, I find that, you know, there's two things that, that tend to happen. This is my own experience, right? You ask yourself weak questions. Is eating this one little cookie with my friend who came into town going to kill me? Mm -hmm. Obviously, the answer is no. Same, the different question. Is eating this one little cookie going to help me get further in my goals? Same answer. Same answer. No, it's not. No, it's not. And potentially different result. And, um, and so the opportunity there is to be a leader among your friends as opposed to allowing yourself to feel shamed or trivialized because you're not, you're not engaging in the same behaviors that may have contributed to the outcome that you ultimately don't want. Mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your thoughts on that? 
so I have this, I have this idea that living a healthy lifestyle in general is going to put you in the minority of the minority, right? Mm -hmm. Just in general, it don't matter what race you are, especially if you're, you know, black or brown, right? You're definitely going to be in the minority if you're eating, if you're choosing to live a healthy lifestyle. I teach this concept to my clients where I celebrate and I ha I encourage them to kind of take on this black sheep identity, right? And almost lean into it where I almost took pride during my weight loss journey of being the, the guy at the table in the social setting who ordered the vodka soda and the salad because I recognized very early that I was going to get ridiculed and people were going to have their little slick remarks. And I had to push against that, I guess, natural urge to feel accepted. And I knew very early that, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't hold on to that desire to like be understood and for people to, I knew people were going to, I knew I was going to make people uncomfortable. So that's the thing you got to understand. Like normally when people talk shit about your, your new lifestyle choices is because you're probably activating some sort of insecurity inside of them. So having that understanding is very key. And then leaning into this identity of being the outcast, because you're going to be the outcast in most, until you start making the fit friends, <laughs> you know? And, and then you, that, that sort of thing is normalized in that world. But until that happens, you kind of got to lean into, you know, being the outcast. You know, I call it the black sheep. What does radical responsibility look like in the, in the journey? Hmm. Yeah, just just understanding that your body is the manifestation of your choices, you know, and no exceptions. Yeah, it's just yeah, because you can have this story about, oh, I was brought up in a household where this is how we ate or I have these genetics or I have this. It's like that does not serve you to let yourself off the hook with those things. Right. It doesn't change your physique. It doesn't change the way you think. It puts you more in this victim mindset. But when you have this like total, you know, radical acceptance and, and ownership of all parts of your journey, it puts you more in a position of power. Right. It allows you to activate your power of choice. And and, and then it's it's on you. You know, like that kind of burnt, melts away a lot of the excuses that typically are leaks for our efforts in, in transformation. So I'm real big on just owning, owning your choices and, and understanding that this is 100 percent on you. And I don't care. You can't blame your your wife or your husband. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame anyone. This is all on you. You put the food into your face <laughs> straight up. Right. It sounds like a really intense and sort of heavy way to relate to it. But the great thing about it is if you are the sole problem, then you are also the sole solution. And all you have to do is make some different choices and you'll start to see the needle, needle move in the opposite direction. And I don't want to oversimplify this. It's simple, but I understand it's not easy. And that's mm -hmm. why it's important to really learn to celebrate the small wins, like the, the, the small victories and allowing yourself to build the momentum to build the habits, to build the, the mindset. And a big one, and, I, and I, I would be doing your listeners a disservice not to mention this, is to really start to pay attention to the, the, the self-talk, right? That's when we, when we talk about identity, that's usually the clearest by the self-talk, right? What are your attitudes? What, are, what type of language are you using, right? Oh, I have to work, man, I gotta go work out. Or do I? Or do you get to work out, right? Mm -hmm. Again, perspective, language, attitude, those things matter so much. Right. Instead of seeing it as a punishment for the pizza you ate, see it as a celebration of, of what your, your willpower and your strength. Yeah. Absolutely. I heard one guy say the hardest weight to lift is walking in through the front door of the gym. Yeah, front, that's, that's so <laughs> I love it's that. So real. It's so real. I, you know, I, mean, I noticed that the other day because I'm on this running program and the, the hardest thing was for me to put on my running shoes. That was the hardest part of this whole ordeal. So that's that's real.
Damn. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. You said, don't compare yourself to other people, which, which is kind of like saying, avoid the sunlight. <laughs> How do you not do that? Mm, I'm real big on just affirming to yourself, right? When you notice it, you first understand that it's, it's like a cancer of the mind to do that, right? There's nothing good that can come from it. I understand it's a very natural mechanism of the mind, but whenever I notice myself doing it, cause I still, I do it in other areas of my life. I, I just remind myself with a internal affirmation that this journey is my own, right? As corny as that may sound, I try to just replace those thoughts uh, because nothing good has ever come from, from us comparing ourselves to other people. You know, it's, yeah, it's just, it's just nothing, it's just nothing productive, productive about it. I think another habit worthy of, of being mindful around is, is in demeaning people who have achieved the things you want to achieve and, oh, it's not all that, you know, they're probably not happy inside or they probably have problems with this. Like that, that's none of your business. That's yeah. none of your business. If you're going to be doing some comparison, maybe just appreciate, disagree mm -hmm. to appreciate and not create stories around what it means for them to have achieved whatever it is that they've achieved. Yeah. And that again, frees you up to bring the focus back to you and your journey, which you say never ends. And I think most of us, we get that. We agree with that. Yeah. It never ends. You're always in a health journey, but I think the more interesting concept is how does it start? Right. Because when I take people through the meditation training, I'm teaching them stuff they never would have thought of on their own. I mean, so much of it is counterintuitive. And even though we have all the, you know, we have access to all the information in the world, what we don't often have is sequence. Right. And, and sequence is so important when it comes to transformation, like real world transformation. So me reading Scrawny to Brawny. That's what it provided me with was not just information, but you need to do this first and then this second and then this third. And you only work out three days a week and in between you need to do this and you need to do that. And don't do this. And, and when I started applying the sequence, the thing just kind of fell together like a freaking Tetris game. Everything just stacked perfectly. And I started to see outcomes that I wanted. And I'm sure you have the same thing. I mean, obviously you're a big YouTuber. You've got, I don't know, a thousand videos on YouTube that you've made. So talk a little bit about starting the journey. And if obviously if someone's serious, they should consider working with someone like you. You do online coaching. You have programs for people who want to transform. Um, but let's say they want to start with just the YouTube channel. Is there a way to kind of figure out a sequence that works for them? What are the best questions that they need to be asking in the beginning? Yeah, that's a great question. I think honestly, the first place to start is educating yourself on nutrition, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's the first, I think that's the, the thing that moves the needle the most initially, right? Is really understanding how calories work. Um, and so, so there's that. And then I think the second step, honestly, is understanding your relationship to food, right? So, so there's understanding nutrition, right? Aside from just nutrition in general, and then like really understanding what, how do you use food, right? Do you use food for nourishment or do you use food in a not so healthy way, right? Just like understanding that because it, a lot of us, we, we don't really see how, like, I had no clue how I ended up 350 pounds. Like I didn't, I didn't know it was because I was using food as a numbing agent. Right. And that's often hard. And I've gotten pushback from suggesting that early in people's journeys because they're like, man, people are not ready for that. They, they, but I think we need to change that narrative around. Like we can't avoid these uncomfortable truths about 
what it takes in order for us to make these new, you know, lifestyle uh, choices stick. Um, so nutrition, I'm a, I, I have clients and, and I, I would suggest your listeners doing a little research on this. It's called the food mood journal, right? And it's simple. You write down what you're eating. You write down, you know, how you're feeling, right? Emotionally. And then on a scale of one to 10, how hungry you are before you eat, you write down what you eat. And then you write down, you know, how you feel after you eat emotionally, scale of one to 10, how hungry you are. And you do that consistently for a week or two, you'll start to learn so much about your, your relationship with food, about your patterns, your triggers, your habits. And that gives you a bird's eye view on really what you should be addressing in order to change your relationship with food, in order to change your body. Now, I know that's not the typical, you know, obviously exercise is important, but I don't think people in the beginning of their journey should be bogged down with the science of how many sets and reps and what style of training move your body. Just move your body at first. If that means just walking, if that means playing with your kids at the playground, move your body, focus more on the mental and emotional aspect of your relationship with food and learn about nutrition in general and just start there. When it comes to trying to better yourself and create better habits and you live around a bunch of people who just, for whatever reason, aren't interested in doing that, what are some of your best practices for either getting support from people or creating space and healthy boundaries for creating the habits that you ultimately want to have? I actually have a, a document that I prepare for my clients that guides them on how to have the conversations with the, with their loved ones. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important for there to be respect and understanding, even if they don't want to join you on, on the journey, but there has to be some sort of collaboration on ensuring that, you know, the environment is set up for you to have success. I've had clients buy a second refrigerator, right? And that they put in their office or in the garage to just make a clear boundary between where they get their food and so that they don't even have to be exposed to, you know, the temptations. So just figuring out what that looks like, maybe bringing some creativity to, to this situation in order to figure out a solution, have a particular cabinet that is just your cabinet and you don't have to go into the other cabinets. Like I said, the refrigerator idea, having conversations with your loved ones, trying to get them involved in a way where, you know, they may not necessarily have to be on the journey with you, but asking them like, hey, listen, this is something that is meaningful to me. I'm trying to like break it down for them. Um, it, it, I think are some really good strategies to help with that. And when you first started your, your process, your journey of transformation, was there a specific um, cadence or type of exercise that you saw the most progress with? Because I feel like if people can just get a win under their belt or two, then that will give them the momentum to continue moving through the resistance, the internal resistance and the external resistance. Yeah, I, I think I want to answer. So there's two ways for me to answer that question. I think if you're in the beginning of a journey and you haven't had much time in the gym prior and you, and you've, you were eating right now, eating what they call the standard, standard American diet, mm -hmm. it doesn't take much change in order for you to experience some wins early. Right. So let me say that. So finding a way to be consistent in the beginning, especially around your nutrition and making sure that you're eating the right amount of calories and just increasing your activities, your activity in general is going to be a great first start. But to answer your question, I saw the most changes once now, because I'm going to talk about high intensity training. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to do high intensity training when I first started, though. Right. But when I think about the modality or the style of training that creates the fastest change in your body is going to be like sprints, hill sprints, circuit training, you know, with weights, these sort of high intensity, short bouts of exercise, but really high intensity. It creates, you know, quick changes in your body, but it's also hard as hell. 
it's also very discouraging for someone who is just starting. So I would never suggest that. You know, that's why I kind of preface that response with, hey, just move and make sure you're in a calorie deficit. You're going to see changes in your body. But to answer your question, like I said, that hit style training, circuit, circuit training, where you're getting your heart rate up into zone four, zone five, which is like max heart rate. Um, you're getting your heart rate. It depends on your age and those sort of things. But into the 150s, 160s, 170s, that's going to change your body. OK, uh, final question about this. You're, this is a hypothetical. You're in Austin for a conference for four or five days. You land, you get your rental car, you drive to Whole Foods, right? Walk us through like how you navigate Whole Foods and, and what, what are some of the basics that you're going to get for those four or five days? I'm going to get eggs. I'm going to get probably some rotisserie chickens. I'm going to get some frozen veggies. I'm going to get some microwavable like quinoa or brown rice. I'm going to get avocados. I'm going to get berries. So you're on the perimeter of the store still. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> for you sure. haven't gone into any of those aisles yet. <laughs> no. no. And because I've recently gotten rid of like protein bars and those sort of things. And I, I still have my clients grab that stuff because you want to have accessible snacks, you know. But now um, I, I typically just snack on nuts, you know, like cashews or pumpkin seeds. Like I, I would grab some of those. Um, yeah. And, and I just keep it simple. Keep it super simple. Oatmeal, eggs, protein powder. Um, and my, you know, make my, my protein oatmeal, some peanut butter. Um, yeah, that's, that's typically how I would eat. You know, if I'm, if I'm in an Airbnb, I would have things that are pretty easy to prepare. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that's how I would do it. So I have a hack. You're going to find this hilarious, right? Because it sounds so off, but I'm a big proponent of never going to the grocery store hungry because that's just a recipe for buying a bunch of bullshit that you're not going to need, you know, some short term gratification stuff. But even more than that, eat some bullshit before you go to the grocery store. Hmm. Like stop and eat some fast food or something like that because you're going to feel like shit and you're going to get to the grocery store and you're only going to want to get healthy food. <laughs> Right? Uh, Think about it. Yeah, I guess. I mean, it's working, so. <laughs> you're gonna be like, give me the celery. I want some carrots. <laughs> I want some broccoli because I gotta. I feel like crap right now. That's funny. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see that working. Little psychological, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't had fast food in a decade, bro. But yeah, no, I haven't either. But I just mean, you know, eating something like a sandwich, something that you wouldn't necessarily consider to be the healthiest choice. Some a sandwich and some chips or something. Go to Chipotle and you know eat a you know burrito or some tacos or something, and then go to the grocery store. Hmm. And you'll probably make healthier uh, choices. I can see how that how that can work for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. All right, so you didn't answer the question about your YouTube channel. You've got got all this content. Is there are there playlists that you hmm. created that can walk people through? Just give them a little bit of a primer. A little bit, bit of an introduction to how you like to approach this stuff if they want to go deeper into what we've talked about. Yeah, so I definitely have like meal prep and nutrition videos that kind of break down the basics. There's this playlist on I have nutrition playlists and then I have your basics beginner exercise playlist. So I would definitely start there. Um, yeah, but just not try not to over overcomplicate it. And 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 a lot of the videos, the intro level videos do stick to the basics and that's all you'll ever really need is to understand the basics of this stuff. So yeah, those uh, playlists are available on my channel. And I consider you to be one of my, one of my coaches, one of my, you know, inner circle of even indirectly or passively. Cause I, I watch your content. I hear the things you say. I'm always like interested and in, in, in inspired by the, challenges you take on and all of that. And you do offer coaching. So talk a little bit about what does that look like and what are your clients most surprised about when they start working with you? I think my clients are most surprised with by how much food I actually have them eating. <laughs> to that, lose weight. To lose weight, yeah. 
that that's the that's the number one thing I think. You know, I, I get that feedback from my clients. It's like, man, this is so much food. Because people think losing weight is about, I'm not going to eat anything. And that's yeah. like one of the worst things you can do, right? The worst thing. You know, I, I typically have my clients focus on high volume, uh, lower calorie foods, which in theory, you're going to be eating a lot of food and volume if you're eating healthier, whole, cleaner, cleaner foods. So there's that. And then I also, I, I think they're surprised at how much difference sleep I'm, I'm i'm always advocating for sleep and i've had clients who when they started working with me they're getting four hours of sleep five hours of sleep five hours of sleep they start sleeping seven hours eight hours and they notice a significant difference in their satiety levels their cravings during the day the way that their body is recovering so that's another big um surprise that um i've gotten feedback from my clients you know about for sure can you give us an idea of, of, you said, low calorie, high volume food, I believe. What's an example of like, if I'm a, if I'm a, your client and like I'm on day, I'm on week one, what's an example of, and I want to lose like, say, I don't know, 50 pounds or whatever. What's an example of, of like a day in the life that you, you kind of put me on that would have been much different from what I would normally do? See, that's the thing. I try not to make it too much different than what they're doing at first. I'm just a huge advocate for st- making small sustainable changes and then building on that over time. I'm not the coach that's going to have you come in and turn your entire life upside down. It's not sustainable, right? It's just not sustainable. So I'm the guy that's going to say, Hey, okay, I'm going to do an assessment. Where, where are the, I guess, problem areas? What are the things that we can address that has the highest return? on that investment of energy. So most of the time, like I mentioned, it's the liquid calories. Sauces. Sauces, yeah, the little new, those little things, sauces, liquid calories, and just the the way that they're preparing their meals. So, So we're not necessarily changing what they're eating, we're just making those little changes. You're not, obviously you can't fry your food, let's bake it, let's steam it, <laughs> right? Like, let's just make little shifts in, in small things that, lead to big changes over time without shocking you and, you know, feeling like, oh my God, I'm giving up, you know, everything that I love. It doesn't, it doesn't require that. Okay. I just thought about one more thing. Okay. We talked about whole foods and let's say you're traveling, you don't have access to the grocery store, but you have most of the, the standard fast food, whatever restaurants, what, what would, what's your go-to place in, What's your go-to meal in that place to satiate the nutritional needs that you have when you're on the road? Yeah, um, Chick Fil A or really? Yeah, Chick Fil A. They have chicken nuggets or or breast. They have yeah. They have the um, they have the grilled chick chicken nuggets, like the little yeah, like chicken nuggets, chicken nuggets, and they have the grilled chicken sandwiches with with uh, wheat bread. And then they can get, you can get fruit instead of French fries, or I'll go to Chipotle and get, you know, double meat, you know, you know, half serving of rice, veggies, you know, grilled, grilled onions and veggies and that sort of thing. So yeah, this, those are my two go-tos, but there's pretty much healthy options at almost every restaurant nowadays. My guy, Max Lugavere says he goes to, if you go to McDonald's, you can get just the quarter pounder patties and it's actual beef, which is weird that we have to even distinguish. This is actual beef, but it's just, it's actual beef. That's funny. And, and that's like, each one is, I think, I don't know, 30 grams of protein or whatever. Like mm. that. Mm-hmm. Beautiful, man. Awesome. Well, I think you gave so much value here and a lot of insight. And, uh, and I hope that people listening to this will be considering all of this as they go to their kitchen, because I think you and I talked about this before, you know, we, we oftentimes see the transformation videos on social media where the person was 300 pounds and they dropped all the weight and you see the little B roll of them in the gym and doing running, but you never see what's going on in the kitchen. And I said, the real video is what's happening in the kitchen and in the bedroom. You know, if you could see that, how those choices change and need to, to, to evolve over time. That's really what's responsible for the kind of transformation that, that most people want. For sure. For sure. 
What's the, uh, let's say someone wants to work with you. What's, what's the best way to do that? Bricksglover.com or Bricksglover on Instagram. Shoot me a DM. Um, and yeah, we, we'll get you on a discovery call to see if I want to take you on. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Funny. What does that look like? Is it six weeks? Is it two months, three months? What's your typical offering? One year. Okay. One year. You got to, you got to commit to this. You know, I've, I've, I've done that in the past where I'm working with people for six, like, no, I want, I want to work with people who are looking to do transformations and that takes time and you got to give me time. You got to give yourself time. So I'm, I'm doing a, a minimum of a year commitment. I have group coaching and I have one-on-one -on -one coaching um, packages, but I'm really big on choosing the right, because that's a part, a big part of success with, with clients is, is making sure that I'm working with people who are at the right point in their journey. So there's a qualification process that we adhere to. Um, but yeah, what, are, what they, are some of the symptoms? Like when the student is ready, how did, how, how, how would you know when you're talking to when them? they're describing what's, what's been the thing holding them back? If they don't mention mental or emotional or, the, or them getting in their own way, then they're, my, they're likely not my client. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys hear that. You got to take full responsibility when you get in your discovery call. With, 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 <laughs> that's a starting you. point. <laughs> Otherwise you're wasting everybody's time. Yeah. I will not, I don't care how much money you have. I will not take you on. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, man. Well, this is an awesome conversation. It's helped, helped me a lot as well. Thank you yeah. so much again for coming back on. And Oh, you also have a podcast. You and Willie have a podcast called, was it? We are gods. We are gods. Yes, sir. The we are gods podcast. We're going to get back good around information in that too. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, I, I just want people to understand the power that they have inside of their minds, inside of their hearts. Right. So, yeah, we, we talk about, you know, transformation from the perspective, from the spiritual and mental and emotional perspective. So, yeah, check it out. It's on all it's on all platforms. For sure. We are the we are guys podcast. Beautiful. Awesome, Appreciate man. You, Appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me. I'm, I, I always enjoy having these conversations with you. <laughs> Truly. It's, and it's such a, it, you know, like people just say that shit. No, I really, I really do. Enjoy. I've been looking forward to this all day. Me too. Yeah. I love you, bro. Much love. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.